Hi, I'm Jack Howell. I'm not an expert on Avram Galber any more than I'm an expert on Robert Marcellus or Marcel Tabito or Trevor Y. As with those videos, my intent is to convey my appreciation for a resource in hopes that you will also find it useful. That said, I think I probably have heard more about Avram Galper than most clarinetists who did not study with him. Uh, we often measure a teacher by the success of his or her students, but even more telling is when the successful students credit the teacher and keep his or her teaching alive for following generations. I was not aware of Avram Galper until I started playing with Michael Rusnik, and I thought I'd, I'd better have what he's having. Mike introduced me to the book Tone, Technique, and Staccato. He told me a lot about his work with Galper, and most importantly, he provided with his playing a daily example of Galper's teaching, such as anchoring the tone in a rich, abundant low register and treating articulation as an interruption of tone rather than as an initiation of it. I don't offer myself as a similar example, but it's not for lack of trying. This video could wind up, could wind up being kind of long, because there's a lot going on in this book. Um, as soon as I figure out how, I will put timestamps in the description um, so that if you want to refer to a particular section, you can find it quickly. Uh, by the same token, if you find a, a section boring and non-informative, then you'll be able to skip it. Galper's exercises are like push-ups. Everybody knows how to do a push-up, right? Well, a perfect push-up is difficult. A sloppy push-up is easy. Great athletes do perfect push-ups and are deeply aware of form and how form relates to muscle activation and ultimately to performance. Slackers in gym class don't care about activating their cores. They do as little of a push-up as possible, and they only do as many as they must. Musicians are athletes of the small muscles. You can accomplish a lot with this book if you play the exercises the way Galper intended, the way a world-class athlete would do push-ups. If you have a copy of the book, follow along. If you don't have a copy, I recommend it. Um, I specifically, I would suggest that you buy it from an actual music retailer rather than from, say, that jungle website. And kind of a, a soapbox uh, warning here. I think it's wise to spend our money with people rather than computer programs and to support small businesses. If you have a local music store that rents band music and carries, uh, rents band instruments and carries music, uh, give them a chance. Online, dig a little deeper in the search and, and, and find a small business. If it takes an extra day or two or it costs an extra buck or two, I think building a relationship is worth it. Back in the days when the only way to order by mail was to call someone on the phone, the folks at Devil Music and Liban Music seemed to know my voice, and that was cool. Recently, I've been buying music from Cameron Hughes at clarinetallmusic.com. There's a link to the Galper book in the description, which he started carrying because I asked him to. This is not a sponsored video. I just think that Cameron, who seems to do everything himself, is doing a great job. And if people like him don't succeed, we will all be poorer for it. When I couldn't find the Tabuto CD um, anywhere except on the Jungle website for 45 bucks, Cameron started carrying it. So now you can get it for $16. And if that seems backwards, maybe do a search on dynamic pricing. I'm not telling anyone what to do. I'm merely suggesting that you give it a moment's thought. The first link in the search isn't the first link in the search because that company cares about music or about musicians. Okay, off the soapbox, onto the book. Um, this, is a, this is one of the fundamental resources that I use a lot. I made a video called Behrman 3 and the Good Life where I talked about the rationale for a consistent fundamental warm-up. Uh, and in that video, I said that Behrman should not be our only source for fundamental exercises. 
There's a big difference between consistency and routine. And one of the dangers we face in practicing is becoming too comfortable with a regimen or an exercise and simply repeating it without being fully engaged and focused. I always say thoughtless repetition is corrosive. So it's a good idea to switch things around periodically if for no other reason than to avoid getting stuck in a rut and developing bad habits. Tone, Technique, and Staccato uh, is a book I use with every student at some point, and it's part of my own practice of rotation. Like Behrman, Galper should not be your only fundamental resource forever, but I think there is something in it for everyone, and this is how I use it. And just to make sure that I wasn't completely off base, I sat down with Mike Ruznik a few days ago and went through the book in, in detail for his and Galper's advice. He had some points of emphasis that I will mention in due course. Galper's approach to the clarinet was both logical and rigorous, passionate and artistic. Most of the book is in eighth notes, not sixteenths. There's a reason for that. Rest assured that Galper's students also consumed a steady diet of Behrman and played plenty of 16th notes. But first things first, Galper clearly saw no point in playing a blizzard of notes before building a strong foundation of doing simple things beautifully. And beautifully is the key word. We must not create a division in our minds between technique and music. They are the same thing. And while Galper doesn't put it exactly like that, his exercises are all clearly meant to be played musically, not mechanically. He says so. So speaking of what Galper says, the first thing I draw your attention to is, is his introduction. Um, I'm often surprised by the number of students who have had this book for a period of time and have never read the introduction. When Galper says that practice does not make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. When he says that practicing fundamentals is like putting money in the bank, he reminds us of what every decent teacher in the history of teaching has said. For the student new to this book or to this approach, I recommend taking a minute every day to read the introduction, 10 tips for successful practicing, until you know it by heart. Galper's advice, in my opinion, is unassailable. And, like a mantra, if you repeat it often enough, you will become it. So, let's get to the exercise, beginning with the low register exercises, which I will call Section A. Uh, and Galper gives a, a paragra paragraph or two how to use this section. Um, there are 23 of these exercises, pages 10 to 15. Galper was of the Simeon Bellison School in believing that a beautiful clarinet tone is built upon a solid, rich, abundant first register, out of which we select the harmonics for the upper registers. This isn't how I was taught. I was taught more in the Bernard School, where you start with a beautiful, clear sound in the upper register and, and try and propagate that clarity down into the lower register. But listening to Mike brought me around. So. As Galper says, these low register exercises are the foundation of everything else that follows. So when you play them, you use a vibrant sound, you create quantity first, then control and shape it. And this starts with the instant the tone begins. If you watched my interview with Mike, you may remember him saying that he wants his first molecule of air to make sound. Putting our best sound at the point of the stick is what we generally, generally call the attack. Uh, my colleague Ron Samuels objects to this term because of its aggressive connotation. Indeed, if you look it up in the dictionary, the only meaning that does not involve force or suddenness or hostile intent is the last one, the beginning of a musical phrase. So while I would argue that we musicians know what attack means in music, and therefore a gentle attack is not an oxymoron, I'm also open to the possibility that there's a better word. If you have one, please leave a comment. In any case, I was taught that we always begin a tone with the tongue on the reed. That's what Bernard said. 
Galper's approach is different. It is that the tongue makes no sound. Only the air can make sound. The tongue can only arrest the sound by stopping the vibration of the reed. Therefore, we should train to begin the sound at full quantity with the air only, without using the tongue as a consonant crutch. Then, just as with speech, we have options to begin the phrase. This is very important. While we may choose to use the tongue for security or a particular music effect in making an attack, if we cannot begin the phrase exactly on time without the crutch of biting the reed or damming up the air with the tongue, we have the musical equivalent of a speech impediment. So, with these exercises and with everything else in this book, the initiation of the tone should be with air only, not with tongue, not with embouchure restriction, not with biting. The air should immediately energize the tone as though we were singing a, vowel, uh, a vowel. If it doesn't, the airstream is too weak or unfocused. So I realize we're talking a lot before we play a note, but this is very, this is very important. If we play these exercises and the first note has a pinch, or an airy, hissy beginning, or a consonant, or if it's not immediately full and rich, stop and try this drill. Play the first note as a long tone forte. Now typically when we play a long tone, the sound gets better as we hold the note. That's the idea, right? Well, yes. But when we play music, the audience shouldn't have to wait for our tone to become good. The tone must be good instantly so that even short notes are beautiful. So once you find this, the full, clear, ringing center of, of your sound, stop the air, replace the air without changing anything else, and uh, achieve that ringing sound instantly with no artifacts preceding it. You don't move your embouchure, you don't move your tongue, you don't relax and inhale. You want to, to eliminate every variable except the air, so that when the air arrives, everything is already set for the middle of the tone. And thus we eliminate all the habitual launch sequence garbage that can spoil attacks. So the, this is what I call the center of the stake drill. And here's what it usually looks like when I ask a student to do it for the first time. We're going to take number one, which starts on the low G. And I say, no, here's what I'm looking for. So center of the stake, the, 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 the very first sound that strikes the ear is the middle of the tongue. And all my students know that that drill is coming when they make a, a hissy or a bitey or, or a tonguey attack. So that's the first thing with these exercises is that from the very beginning, we will not waste one single millisecond not making our very best tone. You make the first molecule of air grip. It's right there. It's the first word in the title of the book, tone. So now we're committed to our best tone and a clear start with airstream energy. No tongue, no bite or embouchure pinch. Time to play the first exercise. And most students start off playing it in sort of like this. So I say that's, we're playing notes, we're not playing intervals. That's mechanical, non-committal finger wiggling for the sake of technique. When we create a thought distinction between technique and music, we're wasting our practice time. If you play exercises mechanically and without passion or beauty, you'll play Mozart mechanically. And then you'll spend the plane ride home wondering why you played perfectly and didn't get out of the, out of the preliminary round. Students almost always play these exercises too fast at first. And I thought I played them slowly. But when Mike played them for me, it was as we went through this book, 
I was surprised at just how slowly he plays them, even more slowly than, than I would have. makes sense. Improvement in this section lies in striving for perfect legato, for perfect sound, for perfect color matching, for full commitment to our best possible tone, and then a perfectly clean attack of every phrase. The slower we play, the harder it is. As he said, perfect practice makes perfect. So imagine these exercises as a clarinet solo in a Brahms symphony make every interval a singing interval. And if you don't know what I mean by that, I invite you to watch my video called The Wisdom of Marcel Tabutone. So you play musical phrases, play between the notes. Don't humor or back away from any notes. Work hard. We are building musical muscle by doing simple things, not just perfectly, but beautifully. And when you need a breath, as Galper instructs, Hold the first note of the next bar, take a breath, then resume on that same note. And this is where we remember Trevor Wise saying, the note before the breath must be the most beautiful note, and the note after the breath must be the most beautiful note. This was something Mike emphasized also. Uh, don't let the ending note die or become pale. Close every phrase with focus. He said that Galper would tell him constantly, no diminuendo, no diminuendo. We must strive always to connect cleanly our tone to the, beat, to the silence at both ends of the phrase, with clarity, but without accent. Now, when you think about it, closing a phrase with focus is the same thing as beginning it with focus. And it's hard, especially when the phrase ends softly but it is just as important and it is commonly neglected. Many wind players get to the end of a phrase and sort of abandon it, and I can't stand that. It leaves no core or pitch to the sound, and anyone who has to play in tune with and tune the end of the phrase with, with you is it's hung out to dry. So don't bail out, fly the plane all the way to the ground. If there's one thing I've learned from Mike, it is, commit to the phrase and make it stick. Don't be a milk toast. Don't sneak in, don't sneak out. You can be delicate and bold at the same time. You can be definite and precise without accent. And I would argue that all great musicians are. So practice it here and it will become a habit. Also, it's not too soon to be thinking about pitch. If your first register is out of tune, upper registers won't fix themselves. And like so many things that are connected, intonation and tone are the same thing. There's a difference between a tone stopping a tuner at 12 o'clock and a tone ringing in tune with itself and being in tune within the key. So this is a, a separate topic, but, but think about it yourself. Uh, it wouldn't be a horrible idea to uh, use a drone pitch at least occasionally and make sure that you're monitoring airstream focus and oral cavity for pitch as well as, as tone. One additional instruction that Mike had uh, about this section, about the whole book actually, that I'm guilty of disobeying myself is to adhere strictly to Galper's indicated fingerings. Even if they seem at first not to make complete sense, or even if another fingering is more comfortable. Mike says Galper had a reason for everything. Uh, most of his fingerings are designed to keep as many notes on one hand as possible, but there, but th there are a lot of little hidden complexities in, in this book. Um, now, that's a lot for one exercise, isn't it? Well, that's Galper for you. 
Mike says that even now he spends 20 minutes just on this first section and that he plays nine of these exercises. It's that important. Now, you know what your practice schedule and capacity for focus are, so you can figure out what works for you. The next section is the transition to the upper register. Let's call it section B. It starts on page 16. And uh, I'm going to put it up, and you can, you can actually see these, these, these markings that, that Mike made showing how to, how to use it. Um, and you can see already that this book is split into sections. It's designed to be used um, in sections. You play a little bit of each, of each section every day. So there are five of these transition exercises that are grouped together on pages 16 to 19, and there are a couple more later in the book that may or may not belong in this section. So as you look at this, you think singing interval? Absolutely, singing interval. As you play the lower note, feel the upper register note in your airstream focus and oral cavity so that when you gently crack open the register key, the voicing is already there and the note comes softly with no hesitation and no accent. So the same rules as the low register exercises with beginning and, and, ending, and ending the phrase. So um, an image I like to use for the singing interval and especially for these exercises is, is the, the image of time-lapse photography of a flower blooming. I'm sure we've all seen it on you know, nature shows that, that the, hour, the outer petals open which reveals the, the petals inside and those open revealing the petals inside of them. The flower changes, but it's the same flower. Each layer of bloom is contained within the previous layer. Just so, we want to feel the harmonics that make the second register G inside the first register C and the E inside the A and, and so forth all the way through. Um, what Mr. Galper says about tongue position is the only thing in the book that I don't think is universally good advice. I don't think it's bad advice necessarily, I just don't think it applies to everyone in the same way. He says, in the low register, your tongue is in its highest position in your mouth, and to move into the upper register, your tongue moves forward and down at the back. He sounded beautiful, and if that's what he actually did, it certainly worked for him. The thing is, I feel, personally, that in order to move into the upper register, my tongue moves up at the back in preparation for the upper note. That it moves before the upper note and it moves up and back. That's what Marcellus taught. He, uh, he quoted uh, Bernard quoting Alexander Selmer to think E when playing, E particularly in the high register. And to keep the pitch up in the high register without biting, we generally want to shrink the oral cavity. But obviously everyone is different. We're different with our, our tongue and, and oral cavity and palate configurations, and we're different in proprioception. Proprioception inside the mouth is really weird. What we think we feel with our tongues is sometimes not exactly what is happening. So I'm not telling you to disregard Mr. Galper's instructions, but I am telling you to be careful and not follow them blindly or deftly or mine instructions for that matter. If it sounds good, it is good. However you accomplish your perfect transition to the upper register, this is a very important part of the book. Mike says he would spend an hour a day on it. Next, on page 20 and 21, we have these arpeggio studies, which I call section C. This is the first thing in the book that might be considered technical, but we're still in the tone section. Um, we must remember our resolve to eliminate the division between technique and music. 
We would think that way even if these were just straight arpeggios, but they're not. There's a bit of a broken arpeggio leading to an appoggiatura followed by a chromatic lower neighbor. So while one could play these exercises rapidly with the objective of getting arpeggios under our fingers, I think that as soon as we lose the feeling for this lovely little phrase and start playing mechanically, we've missed the point. I also think that Galper's um, instructions for dynamics, loud, soft, loud, is a, I think that's ex extremely important. He instructs us in several other places in the book to play the, the exercise both loudly and softly. And this is, this is, I think it's really, really important. It, it's easy to let our tone be governed by, nap, by dynamics. Um, we play loudly, our tone is rich and bright. When we play softly, the tone is, becomes thin and pale. So when we practice, we pick a comfortable dynamic that gives us a pleasing tone, and then we stay there. This is a terrible habit, at least when it comes to you know, playing with other people. Um, so in this exercise, play the first time with enough volume for a full rich sound. On the first repetition, play as much softer as you can while maintaining the richness of the sound. Then on the second repetition, play as loudly as you can without letting the dolce quality in your sound disappear. You will note that playing beautifully and in tune at dynamic extremes is really hard. That's the point. Ideally, as we practice this way over weeks and months and years, we will expand our dynamic range while maintaining the dolce tone. Um, without letting our softest sound become pale and airy and going sharp, or letting our loudest sound become harsh and edgy and going flat. So moving on. Uh, the exercise on page 22, the first one, it says the exercises can help you move smoothly into the altissimo ranger, uh, in altissimo register. Um, that's very similar to the previous transition exercises. Um, but the altissimo changes things, like a lot. Um, I think this exercise, which I mark B1, is very good if you don't have a problem with biting. If you do have a problem with biting, this might be a bad place to fight that battle. So, if you have a strong, effortless, non-biting altissimo, knock yourself out. Otherwise, save this one until the second register transition becomes effortless. Now, right below that, there's a, there's a sentence. And it's my favorite two sentences almost in this book. Um, so I call this section D, at the bottom of page 22. And it continues on page 23. These are left-hand exercises. Um, and I love Galper's instructions. He says... Play these close exercises many times. How many, you ask? Well, I, how good do you want to be? Attain the utmost smoothness, he says. He doesn't say strive for smoothness or play as smoothly as you can. He says attain the utmost smoothness. Make it so. So in this section, Pay close attention to the left hand position because let's face it, if, if you have a bad, le bad left hand on clarinet, everything just got way, way harder. Um, the natural curve of your left hand should allow your left index finger to contact all three necessary points simultaneously and you can move from one to the other with intentional controllable overlap. The, rest of the curve in the rest of your hand should support this position. If any of your fingers splay out flat, it's not necessarily the kiss of death, but it does create unnecessary difficulty, particularly with the pinky, because if your pinky is straight, you wind up moving your entire arm to change keys. And, uh, you know, when I did this, I, I, would do the, I would do the whole section, and I might spend 10 or 15 minutes on, on it. And just you can really feel the, the 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 tone in the throat register. Feel your index finger. Right? You, 
can <laughs> you can spend a lot of time doing that. It goes without saying that it's important to focus on tone in the throat register. It's the weakest part of our range acoustically, but we don't want it to sound like that. So moving on, on page 23, there's another register change exercise, which is a fragment of rows 40, number three. It's a good exercise. Uh, and you could do it here in your warm up as a quick reminder of the singing interval, or you could make it part of section B. Uh, in students' books, I mark it B2. I would guess that Galper intended it to be done every day here, but uh, you will tailor this book to your needs and your schedule. Next, we have the Krepsch exercises, and which I, in students' books, I write this section E. Um, so note that this is the first part of the book that is called technique. And even so, the first thing Galper says about the Krebs exercises is that they are there for tonal control. And he says to play them both loudly and softly. Um, he says, uh, in either case, take care to play with the same good tone. Alternate the slurs and staccato notes carefully. Only after you know these exercises well should you play them more quickly. Even then, strive for clarity of articulation. Um, hard to argue with that. Mike drew my attention to the fact that Galper wrote these exercises, which Krebs notated as 16ths in eighth notes, to avoid undue emphasis on speed. Um, that said, without de-emphasizing the importance of playing these exercises for tonal control. Here's another I, approach I use with them, both for myself and for students, but yeah, mostly for students. Um, in my interview with Ted Soluri, he said that we all teach our weaknesses. I found that to be an interesting observation and I've, and I've thought about it quite a bit. Mike said, that Galper always said, that the faster you want to play, the slower you should practice. And I agree entirely that speed comes not from effort, but from combined precision and relaxation. Like any mechanism, the clarinet playing machine suffers from friction and tension and excess motion. Having a pattern under one's fingers and then letting it run is one thing. Quickly acquiring a new pattern or sight reading is another thing. There's a visual neurological element in playing classical music at which some of us need to work harder than others. And I think of it like driving a car. If you can't see very far ahead when you're driving, either you go slowly or you crash. So we should work on seeing better. Now, if you're a great sight reader, it may seem weird that anyone would have to think about this, much less practice it or teach it. But we can't all be Eddie Daniels. At this, while at this point in my career, I've proven to myself that I can play anything in the repertoire one way or another, and I can sight read well enough to stay employed. I also recognize that I didn't have Galper-esque training early enough. And Consequently, sometimes I have to learn music that some of my colleagues seem able to just simply read. And I say seem because it's part of professional music culture to conceal our work. It's better to be thought of as brilliant rather than merely assiduous. So calling someone a hard worker is usually a backhanded compliment. That said, if you're not naturally brilliant, you don't have much choice other than to work hard. I mean, I guess you could lie to yourself or quit, but, you know, if you're like me, you wind up working hard. So, visually acquiring musical passages, recognizing harmonies, patterns, articulations, clearly imagining them, hearing them, and feeling them in my hands and my tongue before I play a note is something I do, right? I do it when I'm practicing and, and learning music because I simply don't have time for the alternative. And frankly, students don't either. 
rather than blowing and pushing buttons and listening to see if it was right or not and then practicing to fix mistakes, it's overwhelmingly more effective to use your brain, play a passage perfectly the first time. So I will make a game out of these Krebs exercises. They are perfect for this game because they are short, yet they are all complete, coherent musical ideas. The first part of the game is to look at the exercise. Let's say, let's look at number 11. Um, look, see, and think. Clearly note the articulations, identify the harmony. Um, looking at number 11, uh, we're, we're clearly in A minor. We, uh, we, have, um, we have an A minor, it's all in our a minor arpeggio for the first two bars with uh, these little chromatic um, little chromatic lower chromatic decorations uh, there's there's one passing tone and then that goes into a D sharp diminished seventh it's all slurred except for the beginning of the D of the G sharp diminished seventh so um, so we've got a one, we've got a diminished seventh uh, leading tone arpeggio, and then we finish with a, with um, a, a little bit of the of the um, of the A minor with the chromatic embellishments. So we we look and we really see it, and we think about how it sounds, and we try and form a. a a clear mental image for everything about it before we before we play. If there are, if there are sequences, if there are repeated intervals, um, we want to hear everything as, as well as we possibly can. Then play the passage so slowly that you cannot possibly make a mistake, but super musically and clearly enunciated in absolutely perfect rhythm. Robert Marcellus said that the correct tempo to play any passage the first time is that in which you can play it seven times flawlessly. So, there you go. Um, It's not too slow. If you can't execute your mental image in complete control, either you took it too fast or you didn't really have a clear image to begin with. So there's your first challenge. Play something perfectly the first time. Perfectly, not approximately. And musically. A certain percentage of students have never played a passage perfectly and musically the first time in their lives. So this game may be a revelation. Here's the rest of the game. Give yourself a fixed number of repetition, repetitions, three or five or seven. Whatever it is, it's important that it be fixed and that it not be too many. So say five. See what you can accomplish in five reps without making a mistake or losing clarity. Many students have the habit of destructive testing. They will learn a passage superficially, then they'll play it faster and faster until it falls apart. Or they will play it over and over until they stop focusing and become sloppy. So in your five repetitions, make everyone count. Um, make sure that every repetition improves somehow. Now, you, you may go faster, that's certainly one kind of improvement, or you may play more musically, or with better articulation, or better tone, or in my case, the second time I would want to make sure that I focus so that high F natural speaks more clearly. Uh, or maybe you realize how to show the harmony more clearly. Whatever you do, each rep has to do something and must somehow be better than the last. So when you do this, you're basically practicing sight reading. 
you're practicing seeing and hearing something before you play it. And if you practice that, you will get faster and you will get better at it. Whereas if you simply play one note at a time without thinking and you make mistakes and then you have to go back and fix those mistakes, you'll continue to do that. And you won't get better at sight reading. So I realized that that use is not Galper's intent. And, and during the season, I don't actually play that game myself because I'm doing it for real with next week's folder. But I play it frequently with, with students because the habit of firing the missile and then trying to aim it is pretty common. And breaking this habit is where real learning and real improvement begins. Okay, so now on to the close mechanisms which, uh, if you're keeping track, is section F. Um, Galper talks about this in the, in the, in the introduction to the technique section. Um, these are for training every possible alternate fingering uh, with the pinkies and with the sliver keys. Uh, and Galper explains that, that the idea is to build fluency in your use of fingerings. That's in the sense of a language. If you speak a language fluently, you're able to express an idea in several different ways. And you pick the best way for a given situation. When you play a passage on the clarinet, you should pick fingerings that best negotiate a passage, keeping in mind that there are often competing needs. The best fingering for intonation may not be the best fingering for speed or for legato. And this may be a good place to mention that Mike and I differ slightly in our approach to the use of the right hand. Because I am looking for every possible advantage in both speed and legato, especially on bass, I tend to leave the right hand down a lot more than Mike does. And because most students arrive not using the right hand at all, I'm often after them to use it, period. But uh, Mike runs a higher clock speed than I do, and he says that when Galper indicates R for right hand, that means only the pinky, not one, two, three as well. So the advice that I gave you about Midsummer Night's Dream and Wisdom of Robert Marcellus, where I turn it into basically a, the first four bars into a two finger uh, a thing, that's exactly the way Mike would tell you not to play it. And when I asked him if he ever left the right hand down to cross the break, he said, well, yes, but students should learn to do that intentionally, not automatically. I tend to think that the right hand should go down automatically in certain patterns, and therefore we should learn where those patterns are. So there you go. Um, at some point, these close-A mechanisms may become super superfluous. You know, you, you know them, use them all the time. But if they are new to you, they're definitely worth doing with close attention. So now we come to the staccato section. So as with everything else in this book, pay close attention to Galper's instructions. Of particular importance is his advice to think of note groups as two, three, four, one, rather than one, two, three, four. This lines up with my advice to organize your rhythm according to where it goes. Um, most clarinetists are preoccupied with articulation speed and for good reason. However, as I have said before, beautiful articulation and fast articulation both live in beautiful tone. And if we must sacrifice tone to achieve articulation speed, either we're creating tone wrong or we're articulating wrong. The dolce tone is your benchmark. A fair number of videos up to now have involved articulation mechanics. And if that seems like me teaching my own weakness, that's a fair cop. But if beautiful articulation and insufficient speed are not competitive, rapid articulation with bad sound isn't competitive either, at least not, uh, not at the highest level. Anyway, I think that this section is best used primarily for articulation quality, that there are only two parts that are primarily for speed. But if you have speed, by all means, use it. 
As Russ Dagan said, articulation and tone are two sides of the same coin. First thing is, in these, in these scales, Galper writes a run-up bar. It starts with an eighth rest and then, and then continues. Um, you want to use this carefully. Um, don't repeat the eighth rest as you, as you play the bar. And for heaven's sake, don't breathe on it. Um, as I often say, breathe on, in the relative eternity that precedes that eighth rest. Play a long tone if necessary to establish your articulated tone that, that it's exactly the same as your long tone. And then as you play, you should feel that your tone is powering your articulation. The articulation should feel relaxed and, and easy. And if your articulation or your tone suffers once you start moving your fingers, it's time for Bernard's advanced finger staccato. Just so happens I have a video about that. Something interesting, uh, Mike plays with super clean advanced finger staccato, but he says that Galper never told him to do it, and he never actually practiced it as such. It just seemed obvious. So there you go. Not everyone needs the same prescription, but pay attention to advanced finger staccato. Don't try for super short notes. Strive to play super clean notes with your best tone. So, um, the, the, you play something like this, make sure that you've got a, the, the first note is your best sound. Whatever the, the, the number of beats, I was just, I just do the exercise until I run out of air and then close with focus. Um, the arpeggios on the bottom of the left page uh, where Galper says to, to play at one speed and then twice as fast, those are good for speed. Um, and the section at the bottom of the right hand page where you start with a short fragment and then in your best tempo and then gradually lengthen it until you're playing two octaves articulated. That's obviously for speed, but not at the cost of clarity. Um, the exercise at the top of the right page with the expand, expanding intervals is especially good if you focus on maintaining a stable embouchure and oral cavity. Uh, Mike practices these in the, the moderate tempo, then twice as fast style of the arpeggio exercise, uh, one bar at a time. Now, if you play the staccato section thoroughly, you obviously will learn all your major and relative harmonic and melodic minor scales. However, and this is my only quibble with the book, you will only have played your scales with articulation. And I think it's also important to practice scales without articulation in order to build evenness and rhythm into your fingers. If you remember Marcellus's three finger rules, right? Um, articulation actually gives your fingers the chance to be very slightly uneven, especially if you are articulating slowly. So while that's kind of the point of advanced finger staccato, to, to trigger your fingers with your tongue and give your fingers a window of clarity rather than requiring them to, to line up exactly, you also want your fingers to be absolutely precise in slurred passages. So if you're using Galper as your primary warm-up, I suggest adding a legato scale component. You could use Closet, you could use Behrman, or you could just play these exercises uh, legato. Then in the back of the book, finally, there are seven various studies. Several of them are based on or orchestral excerpts. Uh, they're definitely worth doing, and you can be creative with mixing up speeds and articulation, like the twice as fast repeat. Um, to be honest, we don't often get into these studies and lessons, but that doesn't mean that they aren't valuable. And as you can see, it's possible to spend a tremendous amount of time in this book. From what Mike said, he would spend an hour and a half and still be in the transition to the upper register. And there have been times in my career where I've spent two hours a day in this book. 
How much time you spend will depend on your circumstances. But even if you have unlimited time, you may have to assess how long you can really focus. I ask students for a half hour fundamental warm up as a minimum. And that can seem like a lot when they have eight hours of class in a day and a bunch of band music to learn. But the fact is, the band music is usually taking students a long time to learn because they haven't acquired adequate fundamental technique. So let's conclude by quoting Mr. Galper from his preface. He says, in my career as a teacher, I have found that those students who possess great technical command of the instrument are the ones who are able to handle difficult passages with ease. Such mastery frees you to concentrate on the music rather than on the clarinet itself. But there is no shortcut. Practice is the key. The time you invest each day practicing the exercises in this book is like money you put into your savings account. When a difficult passage comes along, you can tap into your account and withdraw what you need to play the passage easily and well. Yep, that's about the size of it. Go get them. <laughs>